We want to talk about um, healing the ethnic divide, obviously, and what you have in front of you, uh, I think, is in brief uh, manner, what we really need to do in order to heal this ethnic divide. I put in your notes, it appears today that the church has developed into an irrelevant institution. Thank you, sir. I think uh, people have not completely, but in large measure, dismissed the body of Christ uh, as being relevant in our yeah. world. And I think a part of that uh, is because, as Pastor Clay alluded to, and I guess everybody's been alluding to, uh, there is a disconnect between our verbiage and what people view in terms of our lives. Uh, we're, not, we're not careful. We don't walk in unity uh, as Christ had prayed for and actually commanded us to do. And as a result of that, uh, we're, not, we're not effective. I believe a major reason for the loss is in our abandonment of our God of day purpose. I think if we understand uh, what God's trying to do, what he's designed us to do, uh, then we'll see that it's imperative for us uh, to actually heal the ethnic divide by simply walking in unity. So what I want to do is just talk about uh, the purpose of the church and if we can adopt the purpose of the church we'll be okay. Uh, I'm gonna have to do double duty here so I'm hoping that uh, this this from last year racism uh, prejudice discrimination antagonism directed against someone of a different really ethnic group. I, I left race there because of the term racism based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Uh, the belief that all members of one, each race possess characteristics or abilities specific to that race, especially so as to distinguish it as inferior or superior to another race you, or races. You mean we can do that well, that'd be great. I appreciate that sort of spirit. Uh, as I say, okay, never mind. No, I was just, just, just going to say um, thank you if I had another like you. I'd have two, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, go on. go on to the next slide. <laughs> Let's see, I can easily. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is the what is the church's purpose biblically? Uh, I I I don't ask that to have you actually answer the question. Matthew uh, twenty eight. Uh, gives us the marching orders for the church and uh, he said I have been given complete authority in heaven and earth mm -hmm. don't rush by that Christ said I've been given complete authority Psalm 24 said the earth is whose? The Lord's. It, it's the Lord's this is, this is God's world mm -hmm. and Christ has complete authority over this world and Paul makes this statement, and we'll come back to, Christ has been given as head over all things to the church. And that's an important distinction, something that we need to understand. So all I really want to do is talk about three, three things. Number one, our purpose uh, is to exhibit uh, the image of God. Exhibit the image of God. Uh, now, you might say, well, what's the big deal about that? In fact, those three things found in the Trinity, formed the creation of man, forfeited in the fall. Um, let's hit the next slide. Let's, let's talk about the image of God found in the Trinity. When you think about the Trinity, uh, you, you see that the Father is not the Son, the Son's not the Spirit, right? The Spirit's not the Father. They're, they're three distinct individuals in one. There's one God, but He exists as a triunity and in the Godhead there, there is this community and it's a close community this continual companionship and there's there's no jealousy between them mm -hmm. the son never says well how come I'm the one that has to die mm -hmm. 
You know, why do I have to suffer? I mean, you get to sit up there and get all the glory. But the Spirit doesn't say, well, I don't get any props. All I have to do is talk about the Son. There's no jealousy between the members of the Godhead. They exist in perfect unity. And, and they have one purpose, one aim. And they cooperate together. At the same time, number two, there's this ontological and economic arrangement. All that simply means is that they're one essence. The Father is not more God than the Son. The Son is not more God than the Spirit. They are all equally deity. Right? So in terms of their essence, they're exactly equal. Yes. But there is economy. In the economy, we're talking about a tiering and order for the sake of activity. So that the son is subordinated to the father, not because he's inferior as some cults teeth, but he has subordinated himself to the father. The father is the head of the son. The son is the one that sends the spirit. They, they order their tearing for the sake of their activity, for the sake of the work that they're accomplishing. And, and that's important. And with perfect harmony, trust, unity, cooperation, partnership, sharing, delight, we see all of that in the Godhead. Why is that important? The scripture says you and I are made in the image of God. So what does that mean for us? If we're made in the image of God, then that tells us automatically that God expects that there will be this close, continual companionship. But even, even in our homes, my wife is not inferior to me, right? I'm not superior to her, but for the sake of order, right? The husband's the head of his wife, right? I mean, God is, he's established the order not because there's a tearing of importance mm -hmm. or work, but just for the sake of getting the work done. Mm -hmm. And so we understand it because that, that's how God exists. Mm -hmm. Hit the, the next slide. It's formed in, in the creation of man. And, and go to the, the next slide because I, I want us to just consider something. God says, let us make man our image and according to our likeness and let them rule over everything. God created man in his image and the image of God created man, male and female created them. God blessed them and said to them. And I, I, I fly through that, but I put these verses up and I, I, I highlighted this because, I don't know, when you read the scriptures and you see something that seems redundant, maybe even unnecessary, then you stop and say, well, what's up with that? Why does he say, let's make man our image and then come back and say, according to our likeness, is he saying the same thing? Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at the Hebrew, you got logos, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is in the masculine. This is in the feminine. Mm -hmm. God is saying, after our image, male, after our likeness. And so God, he says, let them rule. There's, there's equality. Mm -hmm. There's unity. And God, from the very outset, talked about equality, even in the midst of economic arrangement. Let them rule. So God created man in his image, and the image of God, he created male and female. He created them, and he blessed them, and he said to them, get my work done. So there is this unity. There should never be a gender battle. Mm. if we operate biblically, yeah. right? Uh, there, there should never be a ethnic battle That's right. if we operate biblically. Right. If we understood that we were created in the very image of one who's like that, yes. mm -hmm. then we would understand that we are to be like that. Because that's how God designed it from the very, the very outset. Next, next slide. Uh, but of course, our, our calling to display his image necessitates diversity. Uh, someone today, because <laughs> everybody's been really good today, someone today mentioned that you can look at creation yeah. and you see all the different types of everything. Uh, there are over 600 species of beetles. Right? Uh, there, I mean, there are all of these, God has this immense variety. Yeah. Sameness is boring. <laughs> right? It is diversity. You have diversity in color. 
If, if everything were one color, you wouldn't see anything. But everything shows up because there's, there's difference. And it's the difference that brings uh, vitality to life, beauty to life. And that's the God is a God of diversity. And he's designed it as Pastor Clay said, Dr. Clay, excuse me, we need to celebrate the diversity. God's not called us to compete with each other to see who's better, who's worse, who's inferior, but we're to celebrate the fact that he has made us not the same. We're equal, but we're not the same. And so we highlight the differences so we can celebrate them. And that's, that's what God had in mind. God has to be, as I mentioned this before, I just threw that there, uh, require us to connect together. And all I mean by that is that, of course, the image of God, I mean, God is truth. God is love. God is faithfulness. You can't demonstrate any of those apart from other people. Right? So the image of God can't even come out unless we are connected together with others. We, we have to be together and understand the value of being together. I mean, y'all know the people that, you know, they're CME Christians, right? They show up at Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but that's, that's not how God designed it. We need to see the value of being together. Yes, sir. Next slide. It was forfeited, though. Uh, in the fall. Connection, instead of us being together, instead of the first man and woman being together, when you look at Genesis chapter 3, what happened? First they hear from God, then they start playing the blame game, mm -hmm. and they all came under mm -hmm. judgment. Um, how, racism highlights many of the same offenses found in Eden. Here's the next slide, and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, first, you see in verse 7, uh, there was shame, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they hid themselves. Uh, then there was separation. Uh, God had to call them out and say, where were you? I hid because I was naked. Who told you were, you were naked? Did you eat? Did you do the thing I told you not to do? And then it comes out, right? Yes. Well, it's not my fault. Right? It's not my fault. You set me up because you gave me the woman. Right? And so I'm not going down. It's not my fault. You, the snake showed up. I didn't put the snake there. Right? And he didn't ask the snake because Satan's a liar anyway. Every time he speaks, he tells a lie. He's not even able to speak the truth. So he didn't ask the snake anything. He's like, you know, you're going to your brother. But after the, the selfishness, and blaming others for their mishaps, then you see all the sorrow, sorrow for the woman, right? Uh, in her childbirth, right? Uh, then there's a subjugation, your desire, in Hebrew it seems to suggest your desire will be to, to rule your husband, but he, he will dominate you. That's an oppressive term. Yes. He's gonna put his foot on you and keep you in line. There won't be this love. Wow. There won't be this equality, this sharing, this tenderness. It's God. Because sin turns us into very selfish individuals. Yes, exactly right. And we see that played out. And for you, buddy, you're going to struggle. Right? You're going to struggle to make a living. Right? All the way until you die. You're going back where you came from. It's, it's not a pretty picture. And we see, we see this coming out, don't we? Don't we see shaming? You know, at table day, we were... Uh, one of the one of the wonderful sisters in our church, uh, she, she's bright skinned, and she was sharing with us some of the things that happened to her coming up uh, because of her fair skin by the sisters, the girls who, I mean, this is going back to elementary school, who, because they, they, they were darker, and they persecuted her, and she said, it was so bad, I felt ashamed of myself. Right? See, there's a lot of shaming that goes on, all kinds of shaming, body shaming, economic shaming, you ain't got nothing, there's uh, all, well, all kinds of shaming, you get the idea. Uh, separation, you know, we can't exist together, Rodney King said, why can't we all get along? We don't, right? We separate each other. In fact, I was reading an article um, just, well, three, I don't know, three weeks ago maybe, um, it was talking about... Um, 
what happened after the Emancipation Proclamation and how that after that the Christians understood this matter of equality but they still had a problem with the races <laughs> and they, they didn't know what to do to solve the problem so somebody said well why don't we just send them back to Africa and we can set up colonies there like Liberia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was their solution mm -hmm. but this is the African American Christian said no that's that's not right why don't we just act biblical why don't we just do what the Bible says and treat each other as equals mm -hmm. instead of separating you know when we were uh, recruited to come to Flint Michigan they said okay there are no <laughs> no Bible teaching Bible preaching churches in the African American community in Flint and we we wanna we wanna start one okay basically what they were doing is they were gonna pull up out of the, city, the community because the community was transitioning and they you know their previous pastor made them feel bad he made them promise they wouldn't leave until they replaced themselves so they said well we need somebody black up in here because the neighborhood is turning black and so it takes blacks to reach blacks and so we're flighting i'm excuse me we're we're moving <laughs> you know guys called us out of the area because none of the people uh, in our church live in the area so we're going to move closer to where uh, the people from the church live that sounds good right um, you know, I did demographic studies when I got there. I say I told the pastor Bob, you know, in five ten years you're gonna be in an all black neighborhood. Where you going? Because that's where all the, all the people are moving. From, you know, you can't get away from us. <laughs> you, know, you you might as well stay here. They they still left, but but I mean you know this this whole separation thing is people offer that as solutions and uh, that's not biblical. But, you know, sounds good. Anyway, the suffering and the sorrow, you can look back at the history of slavery, Jim Crow laws, uh, all of the things even that happen now, right? Uh, I mean, some of you, you know about the guy uh, that was in the hospital for asthma, mm -hmm. decided to walk outside with his friend. Now, the brother has on a hospital gown, no clothes, hospital gown, and he strapped to a pole with an IV in his arm. He's walking up and down the street in front of the hospital with his friend. One security guard says, I think they're trying to steal hospital equipment. Calls the police. Police come, arrest the guy, put him in the car. He had an asthma attack. They had to call the EMTs to, to keep him from dying. <laughs> What's that? Just, you know, living while black, right? What do they call it? <laughs> There's a, lot of, there's a lot of sorrow, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of subjugation. All these things flow out of a heart of sin. Yeah. And see, the answer, is, as Pastor Clay said, Dr. Clay is, I'm not, I'll keep that Freudian slip going, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, as, as he, see, I lost my place. Let me just keep going. There's, you know, struggle is what we have in life. And, and you understand that. If, if we just understood that our calling is to exhibit the image of God. Yes, sir. Then we would automatically appreciate everyone and celebrate our diversity. Secondly, secondly, next slide is our responsibilities as a church going uh, to expand. Uh, keep, keep going. Uh, next slide. Uh, to, to expand the kingdom of God uh, by fulfilling our fourfold purpose. Now, what in the world is our fourfold purpose? Well, you know, I'm pastor, so yeah, everything's got to be liberated. And this is what, <laughs> so I tell the people I tell you, okay, this is what God's called you to do. You're called to believe on Christ. You're called to belong to a community so that you can walk out the, the mandates of the gospel. You're called to behave like the one who called you, Christ. Show forth the praise of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then you're called to bring others to that one. That's why you're here. God didn't save you and then kill you to take you to heaven. So you can celebrate his goodness. God, God saved you. In fact, I, I say this uh, all the time. I say, God so loved the world that he saved you. Mm -hmm. Right? He saved you 
And now he's changing you before them, and he, he's placing he's placing you among them, and he changes you in their midst, so you can you can walk them back to Christ. That's 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 our purpose. That's our mission. And so, what people see in me is crucial. I, I have no choice but to live out the gospel. Mm-hmm. And if I, if I don't do that, I bring disrepute to the name of the one who called me, mm-hmm. the one who saved me. So I got to let go of my fears. Okay. Um, to expand the kingdom of God by fulfilling our fourfold purpose, by reaching the most on every coast. I, you know, God wants his name all over the world. He wants praise to be found in every part of his world. Uh, hit the next slide. That's a couple of verses, just a couple of I mean, there are, I, you see the ones I gave you before. You can look those up, but, but look, he says, he says, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. That's his goal. Glory. He wants his name to be known, not just here, not just here, not just here, but everywhere, yeah. right? And he says it again in Habakkuk, right? The, the, it, when you get to the the last part. They work so hard, but all in vain. For the time will come when all the earth will be filled, as the waters fill the sea, with an awareness of the of, of the glory mm-hmm. of God. God wants His great name to be known all over His creation. And so, you know, if, if I could just if I could just wrap my mind around that, then I'd be doing. Doing pretty well, right? Oh, more verses. In Acts 17, um, you, you know, I mean, we looked at this a lot, and it's in uh, Dr. Perkins' book, and it's in uh, the book by Ken Ham and Charles Ware, and it's, you know, a lot, everybody uses the verse. Right? <coughs> um, uh, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, God is the one who uh, separated Babel people into people groups, right? And then in 12, he calls a man, Abraham, forms him into a people group, and that people group, the Jews, are to be sought and like to be a testimony to all the nations around them, and eventually the whole world of what it's like to live under God's rule. God has given us that same mandate, that yes, same sir. calling. Yes. People want to know, what is it like to live under Christ? What is it like to live under God's rule? Well, easy, look at me. Mm. Right? You say, well, that sounds arrogant. Say, look at me. And Paul says, he said, follow me. Well, well, well don't forget the last part, right? That's right. Follow me as I follow Christ. See, God wants people to be able to look at us. You know, we just have to uh, have our, our tongues in sync, right? right? As we always say, you have three tongues, right? One in your mouth, two in your shoes, <laughs> right? All three ought to be going in the same direction, yes, sir. right? And then you have integrity, and that's what God wants. <laughs> When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. What in the world is he talking about? Well, he's simply saying that, you know, God, he, he positioned people, and then he placed his people right in the middle of them. So that everybody, you know, when the Syrians wanted to fight with the Egyptians, they had to come right through God's people. Right? When the Egyptians wanted to fight with pretty much everybody, they had to go through God's people. And God, God didn't put his people in a corner where they were safe. He put them right in the middle of the action so that everybody could see them. That's right. And he says, listen, if you will follow my ways, if you keep my laws, I'll make you the head, not the tail. And all of the nations, when they come in contact with you, they'll say, what a wise people. They are. Look at the look at the just laws that they have, and what a great God they serve. Because they they'll see how you walk and live together, and that's the same calling for the church. If we if we get it right, the world gets it right. Because of the the third thing, the last thing that that I want to point out, 
our, our calling is, is to be an example to the rest of the world. Because as Pastor Clay, Dr. Clay said, they don't know how to get it right. They, they, they are clueless as to, to what to do. They try, they try, they try, and they come close. They don't quite get there. Sometimes they're like, they're like uh, 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 Thomas Jefferson. Do you know that Thomas Jefferson and all of his writings and, and even in the Declaration, and do you, you know he was a fierce opponent of slavery? Yes. And, and I mean, he, he tried his level best to, to work freedom for all men into the Constitution. He tried to make sure that all of the local laws outlawed. In fact, he said one of these days, we're going to have to deal with the race issue. And if we don't resolve it, we're going to break this country apart. Mm. And at the same time, Thomas Jefferson had over 600 slaves. Yes. He, he was against slavery. But he owned slaves. There's, there's this disconnect between what we say and what we do. And, and you know, sometimes people, people say, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have anything personal against any ethnic group. I don't have a problem with this group. I mean, the fact that I have a favorite status because of my race, uh, I mean, I can't help that, right? But that doesn't mean that I need to, that I'm going to speak out. I mean, you know, who am I? So you don't say anything. Right? You, just, you just keep quiet. And that happens on both sides of the fence. But God's called us to be an example, to show people. Uh, go to the next slide. An example, well, this, this is, this verse, you know, I'm preaching through the book of Ephesians. And I got to this verse, and I read it in the message, this, this, translation and I had to stop and sit down well okay I was already sitting down I had to stand up and sit back down <laughs> <laughs> Paul's statement is so radical you know breaking in it says all this energy comes from Christ all the things he talked about we have gifts from the father we have guilt and inheritance from the son uh, the, the father chose us and the son Gives us an inheritance, and like I said, we have an inheritance, in, he has an inheritance in the same, uh, um, and the Spirit it seals us, and all these wonderful things. He's all an empty issue from Christ. God raised him, Christ, from, the, from death, set him on a throne in deep heaven, in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to government. No name, no power exempt from his rule. Everything. Yeah. Under the rule of Christ. And not just from the time for the time being, but forever. Look at this. He is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. And at the center of all this, Christ rules the church. Christ is the center of everything in the universe. Christ is the one who gives orientation to what is right for everything. And he's been given his head over all things. To the church. He says, see, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. And he's saying that, that God, Christ, because the church is his body, Christ affects his will in his world through his body, which is the church. So when he wants to accomplish something in his world, he works through his church. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so what he says for us, the marching orders are so super critical. If we understand the mission to affect our his world, Christ has to be center of everything. Mm -hmm. Not just the center of our theology, yes. the center yes. of all of our living. The center of our thinking, the center of our speaking, the center of our responding. It's all got to be about Christ because it is through us that Christ affects his world. Yeah. If we understand that, then there is no way that we can just let matters go and say, well, that's their church and this is our church. No, it's Christ's church to accomplish his will in his world. We have to walk in unity. Mm -hmm. We don't have any options. We're in sin against Christ if we fail to walk. That's in right. That's unity. right. Mm. That's a radical, radical statement. Yes. Christ feels his presence with 
everything. Actually, I, I, I saw that. I'm like, man, I guess we don't. So, okay, and, and go, go to the next slide. This is last slide for the question. We're examples to our world of, of salvation by faith. You know, people trying to work their way to heaven. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, <laughs> Pastor Mane said, he said, some, some witnesses, they've accepted Christ as Savior. They don't even know they're saved. They don't get to heaven tired. Right? <laughs> Working, trying to earn what Christ has already provided for them. Amen. Right? We are examples to the world of what it means to be saved by faith. We're not trying to earn God's favor. And that's the thing about uh, Peter, the whole interaction in Galatians chapter 2, and Peter separating himself. Peter's trying to, to do something to gain the approval of people. And when he does that, he takes a shot at the freedom that Christ has established for all men. He said, you're not walking according to the truth of the gospel. Christ has made us one. And here you are separating when, what he has brought together and unity. Salt and light in our world, right? The, the, the fact that the waitresses say that one of the worst times of Sunday is after church gets out. The church folk come to the buffet or to the restaurant and they will bless you out in the name of Jesus. They are so impatient and demanding and unkind and don't tip with anything. And then they'll say, have a blessed day. No salt. No light. And, and you know, they're trying, you, you know, Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. I, 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 I try to live that out as best I can. I, I give, uh, I, I tip uh, well beyond uh, what is reasonable, even when the service is less than commendable. And uh, sometimes I, I tip and then I, you, you know, I realize that the, um, when, when you put your, your tip in, the tip gets shared with all of the ancillary personnel. It's not just the waitress that waits on you, but it's the people who bust the table and everybody else too. They all share those tips. Mm -hmm. And so then what I do, and sometimes I'll just, the way you've been nice, I'll say, this is for you, mm -hmm. right? But I'll still give a tip, I'll still give 20% or so uh, to on the bill because I know everybody else gets some too. And it's just, I mean, I have it to give because God has given it to me yes. to use. So why not be a blessing? Yes. Mm -hmm. You say, well, they don't deserve it. How many of us deserve anything? Glory. Oh, that's right. Amen. So, you know, Jesus said, you know, make friends of yourselves from the, uh, by means of the, the unrighteous man. Use it. Don't use it to buy yourself a Lamborghini. Well, I'll be I mean, use it to be a legitimate benefit to people. We are to be the model of submission and surrender to God. God forbid that we are disrespectful. Um, you know, I, I, people, uh, well, I don't know what they say because I do it all the time anyway. I mean, I, I pray for all of our civic leaders every Sunday, every Sunday. You know, uh, I pray for, you know, problems and people and stuff. But I, always, I pray for our mayor and the council persons and the governor who ain't always doing right. I pray for him and the state legislature. I always pray for the president every week, every week. Pray that God will surround him with people who will speak in his ear to do that which is right. And, you know, uh, he's the first president that ever had the courage to defund Planned Parenthood. Yeah. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean for uh, uh, at least eight years or so, no president showed up at the National Day of Prayer. Mm -hmm. But he did. Right? I mean, but when he was running, he went to Liberty University and spoke at a Christian college. They say, oh, he's just trying to get Christian vote. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Not the other folk did that. <laughs> Pray for the president. Paul, Paul tells Timothy, pray for those in authority that we might live a quiet and peaceful life in our godliness. Amen. That's right. So, you know, we, we don't take shots at the president. Let me say it again. 
Right? <laughs> we don't take shots at the president. Amen. Listen, if God put in there, I say if because I believe God did. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe God puts all the leaders in. Yeah. If God raises up authority, Amen. we need to respect authority. Yeah. You know, I hate it when these uh, late night talk show people take all these shots at the president, no matter who the president is, because he the office is worthy of respect. Amen. And they, they don't respect any authority, it seems. So we respect, we, we model submission on our job with our boss, right? Uh, I had a conversation with my boss. Uh, he, he retired at the end of this past month. and uh, He was doing an evaluation. He said, Ray, he said, I believe the man upstairs put you here. He says, you get to, to do two great things. You get to help heal people physically through the drugs, but then you get to heal the souls too. And we talked about what is meaningful in life. And, and I said to him, meaning for me in life is being able to see God use me to add value to people. And being able to be a blessing to them. And, and on the job, you know, I, each customer, they're important to me because they're important to God. And it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm wired like that. And, you know, I, I, I am somewhat convinced that he, was, he retired. In, in our conversation, he said he really wants to be able to do something that is more meaningful in terms of helping people. Yeah. Anyway, we, we ought to be modeling that. We ought to be modeling <laughs> unity amidst diversity. Uh, the, the, it's not that difficult. It, it, it's not. It, it just means that you got to die. Amen. I have to die. I have to say, God loves you. I'm trying. <laughs> I, God loves you. <laughs> you know, I mean, isn't it true that God never asked me to love with my love? That's right. That's it's, it's his love. You know, it's like the ragu sauce. Whatever you need, the ingredient, it's in there. Right? It's in the sauce. It's in there. You know, you, you need love. You, you have people on your job you can't stand. You know, you have the, the Charlie Brown thing going, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. You know, do you get that way with some of the folk? And you say, I, I, I just can't. Then you just say, Lord, give me your love for her. Yeah. Or him. Or whatever the case may be. And he does. Yes. He works it out. But you turn around and say, Why are you bothering me? Right? And they're asking you, they ask you how to be saved, but they say it like this, What you, you go to church a lot, don't you? What, what church you go to? Right? You know, I mean they and they'll say, you know, I hope one day that uh, you know, things will turn around for me because things seem to be working out with you know, they'll be tinkering. And 1 Peter 3.15, be ready, right, to give an answer to everyone that asks the reason of the hope that's within you. Uh, two weeks ago, a lady says to me, she says, oh, Ray, you just, you just are so chill, nothing bothers you. How do you get like that? And I said, I can't take credit for that. I said, the Lord saved me, and he changed me. Yeah, he can change anybody. Yeah. And it's because he changed me. He's given me a heart that sees people as valuable. And I understand someone says, every person you meet, every person you meet is fighting the battle. Yes. You don't know what it is. Yes. But I mean, they're not like they are because they just decided one day they're going to be like that. They're the sum total of the choices they made in the circumstances that have happened to them. Some of those circumstances have bent them way over. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you look at them and you say, man, they're so twisted. In their speech and their way. Yeah, life does that, but you know, you just you understand sin breaks people, but Christ restores people. Yes, yes. And they're just telling you that they need Christ. Yeah. And you see them and you say, Lord, give me your love for them. Lord, give me your patience in this circumstance. Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me what I need to represent you because it's your strength. Yeah. Apart from Christ, I can do what? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. But I can do how many things through him who strengthens me? All things. It has never been my strength. 
And solving the ethnic divide, uh, it just requires me to die to myself so that Christ can take up residence and get it done. Yes, yes. sir. Through me. That's all. Yes. Then uh, loving, loving our neighbors. Okay, oh, I only have 14 minutes for discussion. Uh, on, the, on the right side, these questions. Um, let's kind of look at these and, and maybe get a little, a little feedback. I want to hear you wrestle, I mean talk about some of this. How is or how should the image of God be reflected in your home or your church? Or, oh, um, I forgot about this, I'm sorry. Uh, this, this was something, we were going through a series on connecting in our church, and I was talking about a vision for our church, and I say, we, we should envision a church as a, as a healthy community. That's, that's what we want to be. When sick people come in, broken, uh, miserable, hurting, uh, they ought to be able to see that there are healthy people here. Not people filled with animus and vitriol and hatred and enmity and jealousy and backbiting and, and, and speech that is unkind. They ought to be able to come in and say, man, these people, everybody's nice and, and people are friendly and, and people are caring and, you know, I mean, people walk in and they're wondering, well, what's going to happen to me if I walk up in there? And they sit down and somebody comes and sits with them and says, hello, my name is Charlie, you know, what's your name, so-and-so. And it's good to have you here today, you know, you live in the neighborhood, you're from our neighborhood, I'm just, you know, whatever. And uh, I'm so glad you came, you know. And, you know, walking through, here's what we do, and, you know, here's when to stand and sit down and whatever. You know, a healthy community. It's connected to God by the death of Christ. All the members are saved. Connected to one another by the life of Christ. We have Christ's life in us, and, and so we are one in Him. And reaching outside is with the love of Christ. That's what the church ought to be. Mm. And so that's, that's our vision. And then embracing our call to function as a healing community. Broken people ought to be able to come in and be healed. Right? Broken people, hurting people, people who are bent out of shape, people who've been burned because they did the religious thing ought to be able to come in and say, oh, this feels good, right? I don't have to wear a mask. I don't have to pretend. I don't even have to wear a suit, right? I can walk in and when I hear people walk in in shorts and sandals. Some of them are leaders, I just <laughs> Praise the Lord! <laughs> Come as you are. <laughs> you know, I mean, so I, I, I'm learning. I, I'm, I'm getting old. I gotta let go some things. Because yeah. apparently, Amen. this next generation, they ain't no, in no, the no, no, they're not in the dress. Bro. Hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, a healing uh, community. All right. Th yeah, I got you got the questions, Erica. You probably may not be able to see these anyway. It's in your in your book. How is the image of God reflected in your own home, your city, your church? Right? Or maybe how should the image of God be reflected? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Anybody? I want to be a sacrificial lamb, I get it. Okay. Well, I think we should recognize that, that, you know, God has designed us to function together. I, I think we should understand that God has designed us intentionally diverse. And that we don't compete with each other. We celebrate the differences. I allow you to be you. You know, if you want to raise your hands in worship, Right? I don't have to go through that. Right? You can be what you want to be. Now, you can't run down to the front of the altar right? and disrupt things. <laughs> you know. But you can stand in your seat and you can be kind. And you, you, know, you can wave and you can get into it, you know. And if you want to, you know, you don't have the freedom in your spirit to be able to enjoy the Lord, I mean to uh, sing up-tempo songs, uh, you know, okay, I mean, eventually we'll get to him and you can feel comfortable, but, um, yeah, you be yourself, you know, but 
people should be able to come into the fellowship and be who they are and not have to pretend. They shouldn't have to come and, and squeeze into something that's not them in order to be accepted. Mm -hmm. They should be able to come in and say, I'm, I'm here, do you care? Does it matter to you that, that I'm here? Not that I fit in. Does it matter to you that I'm here at all? And it, and it should matter. What barriers prohibit an accurate expression of the image of God? What barriers? Selfishness. Well, selfishness, yeah. We, you want to tease that out a little bit more? You know, I just think about you know, everybody bring their own... Um, baggage to church mm. you know and everybody's at different growth levels right so sometimes that doesn't look good mm. to that person that's coming in that's not a Christian mm. because they begin to see some of that baggage acted out and it was all about me some people haven't come to that some Christians haven't come to the realization that they need to lay some things down mm, right. you know, mm -hmm. and that people are different you know right and they don't mm. accept that thing well. Mm. Especially when you're in an older church sometimes. Some people are set in ways. Right. And it's like, I can't do change. Right. Change is threatening, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it ought not to be. Uh, I mean, just read the scriptures. <laughs> right? God, God, he's the same yesterday and forever. And to, today, yes, and forever. today, yesterday, and forever. Right? Uh, but boy, did he, he flip the switch on some things. Right? Constantly. Right? Yes. Um, I think a barrier is that we fail to distinguish between what is tradition mm -hmm. and what is preference mm -hmm. and what is scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we begin to think that, well, we've always done it this way, so this must be the only scriptural way to do that. Mm -hmm. Rather than recognizing that we did it that way before. But you can do it a different way, mm. and you can still be acceptable. Right. To hold the line on what's biblical, mm. but to flex on preference and tradition. Now, Lorraine, in appropriate, in appropriate way. Lorraine, you aren't suggesting that a lot of what we do comes out of the book of second opinions, are you? Uh, you know? <laughs> we have those preferences and, and a lot of times you know this is how we've always done it therefore uh, this is how we need to always do it you know we had a, a, a discussion in our leadership team about uh, how we would uh, order uh, offerings I'm, when I say offerings I mean church events and uh, you know we had talked about flipping uh, our Sunday school and maybe just having adult worship in junior church and then having children's Sunday school right you know we were trying to figure out how do we get most of the adults because we we don't have a lot of volunteers how do we get most of them under the hearing of the word and you know we can always they can get the sermon on SoundCloud those who do junior church you know we were just trying to figure out how to do it and the idea of flipping things, some people are like, <laughs> right? I mean, the scriptures say that you have Sunday school first and then worship service. That's what it says. I mean, ain't that in the Bible? Right? <laughs> but I mean, you know, you, you, you have those discussions. Yes. Because people don't really like change. They don't. There's a reason Jesus asked that man laying at the pool of Siloam, do you want to get well? Wow. Yeah. Sometimes people get very comfortable in their misery. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to change. Right? That's right. Okay, and that can be a barrier. Anything else? Right, and I think some of them have been mentioned all day. You know, fear. Uh, we don't know what's going on. Uh, sometimes we, we don't fear the people who might come in. Uh, I think they had a discussion here about having Marta uh, go out to Cobb County um, and, and come back and I think they were not wanting to do that because if Marta goes out to Cobb County then some of the, the, the people in the hood now they can catch Marta out to Cobb County you know and they don't necessarily want to do that right so uh, there is that fear and sometimes fear keeps us uh, from uh, feeling 
a safe, you know, and we can compromise. That can, that can be a barrier. What kind of struggles do we face that are pan cultural? And by that, I, I mean everybody. I mean, it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, uh, you have the same struggles as everybody else. You know, you don't have a different struggle just because you're a different ethnicity when it comes to raising your kids. Mm -hmm. All kids are born sinners. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They're all difficult to raise. And, and teenagers don't listen to any parents. They don't care. Yeah. All right? Well, yeah. sometimes. All right. I mean, you know, some things are common. In fact, more struggles are economically driven than ethnically driven. Right? And I think if, if, it's if you get with others in a similar life station, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, when we were in seminary, uh, we were with couples uh, who had small kids like we had small kids. And we just had fellowship. And we could talk about life. And it didn't matter what the ethnicity was. Because we were in the same life station. Um, is it difficult for you to empathize with the struggles of those outside your own culture? That would have to be yes, in most cases. And why is that? Because we, we're not there, we don't understand it, we don't mm -hmm. know how it got there, or why it's in place. Mm -hmm. or, or why why would it be a concern to me? I, it doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah. it does. Mm -hmm. We just don't know that it does. Right, right, right. Does it, does it matter? Uh, that in in my neighborhood, as I drive by, uh, right near the school, they've got a big uh, um, billboard with liquor, liquor on it. That matter. And my first thought was they they don't have that in Grand Blanc, which is the other side of the track. But they 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 don't have a problem putting it up over over here. You know, and it's just one of those things. And, you know, our, our leadership team. Uh, you know, praise the Lord for that. We, we discuss a number of things. In fact, some of the guys, well, one of the guys, uh, Jason, um, he, uh, he, he listens to gospel rap all the time. And uh, Jason's, uh, he's, he's, uh, um, he's from the majority culture. <laughs> because I don't want to say he's black or white or whatever. But, you know, he's, he's, Throwing out the names of gospel rappers, I don't know any of them. You know, you, 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 I felt like you know the guy in Green Book. You know, did you see that movie, Green Book? Okay, well never mind. <laughs> but but the, the 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 white driver in Green Book says to the black guy, he says, "I'm blacker than you are. You don't even know the name of your own artist." You know, you, and, yeah, but by the time Jason got through, I felt like, I man, I don't know any of these guys." You know, but it's just one of the things we talk openly in our leadership meeting about about the struggles and the things that come up, current events that come up in the community and, and we dialogue about here's here's why we feel that happens mm -hmm. because they don't always they don't always see it. They always think about it. But it's good to talk about it. You know. And if you can't talk about it in the church, where in the world can you talk about it? Wow. Right? Because the love of Christ binds us together. Okay, well, you know, I think time's, time's gone. Uh, as you look at, at these, these questions, uh, and num number four, are, are you willing to let the love of Christ, the love in your heart, the love of Christ, walk in, in their shoes for a moment? Yeah. Are you even trying to understand why the person uh, who says, well, I don't see why that would be an issue. He said, what do you mean? You, what, what, the, the, and you can run right at down their throat about all of the injustices that have happened and, and they, haven't, they haven't seen it. They haven't been a part of it. They, they're not condoning it. And they don't know why in the world did you blow up in my face like that. So, you, you know, you have to just kind of think, well, you know, they don't know. He doesn't know. Let's talk about how this looks. And conversation goes in a different direction. What are some valuable ethnic expressions of the gospel that we could or should appreciate? Um, you know, uh, when we first started our church, uh, we had some kids from our mother church, uh, which, which was majority culture. They came and we were singing hymns out the hymn book. 
I just saw a man. <laughs> Y'all call that girl. They want they want a little bit of the uh, African American flavor. Yeah, you know. Yeah. They see the difference and they they find value in that. Right. And you know, some for a long time we trying to get validation by acting acting like like them. Uh, what challenges do you face in sharing the gospel across cultures? Mm. Um, well, my time's gone. Let me let me say this. I shared this before. I was with the. I, I worked at a Kroger store in Atlanta be, um, for uh, a number of years. I had a a coworker. His name was Zanil Jamal. And um, you know, I I, I say Zanil was not like me. So he has a religion. He ain't interested in the gospel. I would be passing out tracks to people and talking to people about the Lord all the time. And uh, then when I got ready to leave, um, you know, Atlanta, I was resigning from my job. Uh, the last time I would see him, I said, you know, it's not even fair. I'm just going to shoot him with the gospel. I mean, I'm just going <laughs> to give him a track. <laughs> At least I can say I gave him a track, yeah. right? <laughs> So I, I said, Jamal, Sunil, here. And I handed him the track. He got it, he looked at it, and he said, finally. Mm -hmm. Finally. Finally. My Lord. You, you gave me, you, he, he watched me give the gospel to all these people. Uh -huh. Never Hello. shared it with him. And here he is wanting to know what it was like. Wanting yes. to know. Yes, yes. You never know. Yes. See, we assume that there is this wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are people. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. People need Christ. And if we could just get past all of the perceived differences and walk in love and say, listen, I love you too much to leave you in ignorance about the greatest news that ever existed, about the greatest need that ever existed. Yeah. And share the gospel. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many yeah. people would open their hearts to Christ yeah. if you just let the gospel be. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for allowing us to have uh, uh, just this time. Uh, Father, I just pray, uh, heal us. Uh, on the inside we we erect barriers really we adopt the barriers that have been erected uh, sometimes uh, social media and even the public media uh, shapes our thinking uh, we are more informed about what the world feels and thinks and we react to that and we don't always filter what they say and feel through the lenses of your word Jesus. father uh, strengthen us to be biblical uh, strengthen us uh, to walk in your truth, walk in your truth, to love you, to love your word, to walk under the authority of your word, and to walk in love to those you've created and have brought into our uh, circle of influence because you love them. May we make Christ known to them in how we live and speak. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Oh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Good job. 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 Good